thanks very much for that very warm welcome. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri traditional owners and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I thank the ECCV, um, but particularly the Lipman family for inviting me to deliver this oration and I, I thank Language Loop. Um, <clears throat> arranged here. Sorry about that. Yeah, thanks. Oh, that's great, thank you. <clears throat> it's a special honour to deliver the Walter Lippmann oration. Walter Lippmann's life, a life that spanned most of the 20th century from 1919 to 1993, is an example of the best of Australian leadership in creating civic values, such as good citizenship values, a respect for cultural diversity, the right of ethnic groups to maintain their religious and cultural traditions and their languages, uh, within the parameters of a modern multicultural nation, their right to preserve, maintain and adapt ancient cultural and religious values and traditions, such as languages, um, <clears throat> and to thrive in the Australian society and economy. As a Jewish leader, he contributed to the rapidly growing and changing Jewish community in Australia with his constant advocacy and deep thinking about the issues they face settling in a new country after the horrors of the Shoah. He and many members of his family escaped Germany. He arrived in Melbourne on the 20th of November 1938. During his voyage in Germany, the Nazi Sturmabteilung, or paramilitary stormtroopers, executed on the 9th to the 10th of November throughout Germany and Austria, Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, and arrested and sent to concentration camps 30,000 Jews. I was greatly assisted in understanding Walter Lippmann's life history and contribution <coughs> to Australian society by reading this excellent book, um, Walter Lippmann, <coughs> Ethnic Communities Leader, Creative Thinker, Dogged Worker, The Kindest of Men, edited by Andrew Marcus and Margaret Taft. They state in their account of his life story that Walter had a sense of mission and was motivated to make a difference in his newly adopted country. It is important that Marcus and Taft use the phrase, the kindest of men, to describe him. Along with the fascinating biographical account and images of documents and photographs, there are examples of his correspondence, studded with elegantly stated and argued views on assimilation, integration, multiculturalism, the need of Australian Jewry to find a sustainable approach to maintain their traditions and a sense of community, and most notably, his great humanism and sense of ethics. The letters reveal a characteristic that we need in our Australian leaders now. Marcus and Taft write, Walter's activism was characterised by inclusivity he eschewed a narrow factional focus and throughout his life he remained pragmatically bipartisan, a proponent of united action. For him, unity empowered, division weakened. His commitment to unity and diversity as a basic social value and principle was inspirational in the rapidly changing Australian society of the 1950s to the 1980s, when its Anglo settler people were having difficulty coming to grips with the arrival of thousands of non-Anglo immigrants and yet still refusing to recognise or respect the First Peoples. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples remained until 1967 and in some jurisdictions, such as Queensland where I grew up, until the 1980s, the subjects of formal legal and constitutional racist discrimination. In his 1976 second annual Labor Address on Community Relations, entitled The Role of Good Neighbours in Community Relations at Home and Abroad, Walter stated in referring to incidents such as the killing of miners at Bakery Hill during the Eureka Stockade Rebellion, that there were in the Victorian population 
um, in 1854, 190,000 people born in England and Wales, about 50,000 each from Scotland and Ireland, 25,000 Chinese, about 2,000 Frenchmen, 8,000 Germans, 5,000 Europeans from a variety of countries and about 3,000 Americans. He goes on to point out that Australia already had a diverse population um, and that at the time of Eureka, Australia also had other important ingredients confronting us in Australian to diet society. And he refers to, and I quote, the consistent failures of Aboriginal administration um, and those were described by the historian Charles Rowley in The Destruction of Aboriginal Society. And Walter quotes him um, and talks about the complete legal atomization of Aboriginal society individual, into individuals assumed or exhorted to act and react in the manner of reasonable Europeans. And so that assimilation process is largely to blame for the highest language loss rate in the world here in Australia. In the language of our day, he writes, the conditions Rowley described are encompassed in the concept of a policy of assimilation, the policy imposed by Australian governments and community structures upon Aborigines and migrants. This policy involved depreciation of other languages and cultures and a pressure to achieve Anglo conformity. In recent years, some realisation has emerged of the fact that such a policy is unrealistic and impractical. Um, each of us is born into a particular family with a distinct heritage. It is important for every individual to know and respect his roots and ethnic background for it is only the individual who feels secure in their own social context who will, free to, will feel free to explore a wider identity beyond it and gain security in the impersonal industrial society in which we live. So those words, I think, need to be repeated and that's why I've quoted him at length uh, because in these dark times, people... Um, need to say these basic human values more often. And so I just want to refer you to an event that took place um, over 50 years ago. Um, during the time that Walter was advocating for an end to the um, White Australia policy, the assimilation policy, and I must say the first one of the first people to use the term multicultural. He was a great contributor to the emergence of policies about multicultural Australia. So I found this one reference to the deportation of a Fijian child. And I want to read you this. It was published in the Daily Telegraph in 2015 on the 50th anniversary of this event. Just to remind you of what was happening during that time and how similar it is today. So the headline is Deported. Nancy Prasad was the little girl who helped bring down the White Australia policy by Matthew Benz. It was the heartbreaking moment when a cute five-year-old Fijian Indian girl with brown eyes and a heartwarming smile would finally be steamrolled by Australian bureaucracy. Exactly 50 years ago this week, Nancy Prasad was standing in front of the Australian media at Sydney Airport as immigration department officials prepared to deport her from the country. A young Aboriginal activist called Charlie Perkins emerged from among the placard-waving student protesters and posed for photographs with Nancy before unexpectedly picking her up and whisking her out to his car. Nancy kidnapped, screamed newspaper headlines the next day. 
um, <clears throat> Nancy recalled, it was quite frightening when the event was actually happening because he was running with me. Um, <clears throat> then he placed me in a Volkswagen with himself and another man and took me to an apartment where there were lots of toys and food. They were kind and friendly and I felt safe, she said. At the time, Mr Perkins said, I feel very strongly about it personally because it's a colour question. Nancy is being deported because of one criterion alone and that's colour and that's bad and immoral as far, to, as far as I am concerned. The abduction had been a stunt to highlight Australia's white Australia policy and it became one of the pivotal events that helped turn public sentiment against it. The Nancy Prasad case was really seen as symbolic of the injustices of the system, a politics lecturer said. In any case, two hours after her kidnapping, Nancy was returned safe and sound to her family. The next day, the immigration department got its way and the little Indian girl was put on a plane to join her parents in Fiji. 50 armed police were at the airport to ensure she got on the plane in a show of heavy-handed force that was a public relations disaster for the government of Prime Minister Robert Menzies. Immigration Minister Hubert Opperman had already shown how out of touch the government was by attacking Nancy's family for stage managing the publicity stunt with a group of lawless people. Um, <clears throat> in any case, that should remind you that here we are more than 50 years later the same thing is happening again and the same language is being used and the same tactics are being used. And so uh, <clears throat> this idea of the Anglo-Saxon country, the white Australia, has not gone away. It's been revived. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting that uh, I've been asked to give this lecture because actually <clears throat> I worked with, uh, I was the last General Secretary of the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. And uh, the reason why I want to um, mention that is because one of the very active and well-known members of FACATSI was Walter's wife, Lorna Lippmann. And uh, <clears throat> so I was elected to the position of General Secretary in 1977. And this was, you know, 10 years after the successful 1967 referendum. And the membership were all of those wonderful people who had waged that 10 year campaign for the referendum change in 1967 to remove two racist clauses from the Constitution. And Lorna was one of those people. And um, she served with many year, for m many years with great distinction, working with other members to achieve Indigenous rights. And I want to acknowledge that one of the campaigns that Fakatsi ran for many, many years was to end the apartheid system in Queensland. They wrote pamphlets, um, they wrote letters. And I grew up under that system. And as a child, I knew the Fakatsi executive in Queensland. Um, so tonight I feel like I have come full circle to be able to present this oration in honour of Lorna's husband, Walter. Um, uh, because both were uh, extraordinary members of a civil rights movement that, that brought about extraordinary change in the very conservative Australia when the white Australia policy was in fact formal policy and law. Um, white Australia had come to an official end um, by 1977, but the work of building a modern civil um, society was still progressing. Um, but Walter and Lorna spearheaded the idea of rights based on respect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And his mention um, in his uh, Labor Day speech in 1976 of Charles Rowley's work was a very radical act at that time. There were very few people 
who were familiar with the history of Australia, um, one could say that's still the case, um, Charles Rowley wrote a trilogy about um, what had happened to Aboriginal people. And the destruction of Aboriginal society was one of them. Um, outcasts in white Australia was another. And then the remote Aborigines was another. And uh, as an economic historian, he explained in extraordinary detail in that trilogy what had happened. So I'm sure that Walter was very well read and in fact read those books. I'm also sure that he was influenced by Lorna to cite that particular line from Charles Rowley's The Destruction of Aboriginal Society. And to do so at a Labor Party event back then, you know, classified you as a, you know, not necessarily the right kind of person to be associated with. Um, a lot of people ha have starry eyes about that history, but I can assure you that um, that Whitlam was able to bring about the changes that he did um, was an extraordinary thing in that party. Um, and unfortunately, those short three years and the changes he brought about um, was, well, it's always well remembered by everybody, but there was not much to follow it. Um, <coughs> But even so, these were years of great hope for the future of Australia, and it would be a tragedy for Australia if the great achievements of that period were to re be replaced by retrograde values that damage our democracy and threaten the most important step yet in achieving full civil rights for Indigenous Australians. Um, the hope of our many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is that the Constitution be amended again and uh, a, a voice, a makarata and truth-telling um, be recognised as spelled out in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Australia, like other former, unlike other former British colonies, has no treaty with its Indigenous people because of the British and European view of our peoples as primitives. There are now three treaty processes underway in Australia of course, the most advanced here is here in Victoria, um, and a treaty commissioner has been appointed in the Northern Territory and also in Queensland. So some advances, such as the Native Title Act, um, some could argue a few other administrative legal developments, um, and um, the formalisation of treaty processes are very important ways of coming to grips with the existence of our peoples for at least 65,000 years here. Customary, our customary systems of law predate the arrival of the British and in many parts of Australia survive, even though sometimes in highly adapted forms. They were recognised in part only in 1992, only 27 years ago, when the Mabo No. 2 High Court case dismissed the legal fiction of terra nullius and recognised the existence of native title wherever it had not been extinguished by Crown grants. And in thinking about this, giving this lecture, I, was, I remembered that one of the um, most important events at the annual FACATSI or Federal Council for the Advancement of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders Association, uh, annual conference in Canberra each Easter was the singing of um, Tabanabana. So um, the longtime president of FACATSI, um, Joe McGuinness, a very strong unionist who hailed from, Lar um, from Darwin where his family had been incarcerated in the, um, in the half-caste compound um, for generations, um, fa made famous by uh, Xavier Herbert's book, Poor Fellow in My Country. He was, in fact, uh, a Kungarikan man. He became the president of Fakatsi after living in Queensland, where he worked on the wharves and became a unionist. His wife was from the Torres Strait Islands. Torres Strait Islanders were admitted as full members to Fakatsi um, 
sometime after the establishment of Fakatsi. And so it was that people like Eddie Marbo, who lived in ta Townsville, were able to join the civil rights movement and think about these issues. So after prayers at the annual meeting at uh, meeting of the Fakatsi members, everybody, I mean everybody in the room, would sing the traditional Torres Strait Islander song, Tabana Bana, um, with all the fabulous hand movements. Um, it's too bad there weren't cheap video cameras back then because sometimes it was hilarious. Um, and so it was that camaraderie at Fakatsi that an I, and the terrific work done by civil rights activists, um, and there were hundreds of them, um, all of my, um, my grandfather's generation and my mother's generation, um, who wrote Australia's future in their pamphlets. And of course, Lorna was one of them. So um, it's, I think in many ways, unfortunate that a pretty much hard decision was made by some Aboriginal leaders about 30 years ago to not join the multicultural movement. And you reminded me of that tonight um, because of the fear that our issues would be swamped by the issues that ethnic communities were rightly raising. Um, but you can sense the same, um, re, you know, feelings about the injustice of those assimilation policies. And I think um, Charles Perkins was right uh, to draw attention to the fate of all of us under the White Australia policy. And think about this, if the, the, the logic of the White Australia policy becomes entrenched again in immigration policies, border force policies and other policies, we will have to join forces and uh, raise the humanitarian values, the civic values that uh, Walter spoke about so well. So, <clears throat> he wrote, there is no inconsistency in saying that we ought to have an integrated Australian community with as few tensions as possible and at the same time that there should be a place for the maintenance of languages, lifestyles and traditions of the people who have come to make their home in this country. And so Prime Ministers went on to declare the end of the White Australia policy, um, Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser in particular. Uh, Whitlam said, we do not want migrants to feel they have to erase their own characteristics and to imitate and adopt completely be the behaviour of the existing Australian society. The old approach of individual assimilation is no longer government policy. We are concerned with integration of ethnic communities into the broad Australian society. By strengthening these communities, we strengthen the whole society. And Malcolm Fraser said, the days of Anglo-Saxon conformity have gone from Australia forever. Unfortunately, he was wrong. Um, <clears throat> but he did say, to be a good Australia does not require somebody to forsake the traditions, the culture and the customs of his birthplace. Indeed, affection for one's birthplace and family traditions makes a person a better Australian. That's what I fear we are losing. Those civic values of 40 or 50 years ago um, to a global fear expressed at the conference that uh, Tony Abbott and Kevin Andrews recently attended uh, as the great replacement theory, a fear that the white races will be replaced by the rest of us. Um, and uh, so all of that great work is, I think, one of the foundations of modern Australia. And uh, so 
many of us take it for granted and I don't believe that we can any longer take that hard work of the 50s, 60s, 70s and into the 80s for granted any longer. Um, young people today have almost no sense of that period of, of Australian history. They're not taught it in school um, and it's not highly valued. And I think it ought to be. Um, those of us who've raised children through that period, I think, make a mistake if we um, do take that hard work for granted. Um, so I also looked up the old records of the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aborigines, later to become the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, um, to see what I could find about Lorna. I couldn't easily find anything online, but just to say that the council was set up in 1958 and some of the um, issues that the council campaigned for um, included repeal of discriminatory legislation, of which there was much, amendment to the Commonwealth Constitution, improved housing, equal pay for equal work, and they won that one, um, as well as the two changes to the Constitution, facilities to be provided for education, and retention of all reserves with communal or individual ownership. So you can see that they also laid the groundwork for land rights, native title, and uh, so much more. Um, so Torres Strait Islanders were admitted in 1964, um, and as I say, Joe McGuinness um, of the Cairns Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders Advancement League was elected president in 1961. So these advancement leagues had sprung up across the country and the Advancement League here in Victoria is one of the oldest Aboriginal organisations in existence and it dates from the end of the Second World War. It's an interesting part of Australian history to remember. Many Aboriginal people um, served in the Second World War. Well, Aboriginal and Torres, Torres Strait Islander people served in all the wars, right back to the Boer War. But m m the, la the largest numbers served during the Second World War. And they served both as uh, uh, military personnel and also uh, civilian personnel working for the armed forces. And at the end of the Second World, when they were all demobbed, they went back to their homes and it was this experience that brought them to the full realisation that they had been treated as slaves and indentured labourers and paid less than other Australians. In most parts of the army, except for the Torres Strait Islander Battalion um, and I think the Palm Island Battalion, our, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander recruits were paid equal wages, mostly I think because they lied about being Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander in order to be recruited. The law said that no Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person could serve in the Defence Forces. And so afterwards they realised the scale of the injustice and they organised advancement leagues and strikes. And so the first strike was in the Pilbara and uh, that lasted for many years and it rolled on into the strikes in the Northern Territory in the 1960s. Many people think that the only strike was at Dagu Ragu. There were strikes right across the Northern Territory, right over to the other side uh, on the Gulf of Carpentaria. And uh, that led to the Arbitration Commission case in which um, Sir John Kerr represented the pastoralists and their right to keep slaves. And a wonderful um, barrister, whose name I've forgotten, worked for the Aboriginal representatives, the Aboriginal plaintiffs, and actually won the case for equal wages in 1968. Um, it was not to be, however, that Aboriginal people would in fact be paid equal wages. What happened was that the pastoralists, who were the main proponents of slavery, 
sacked all their Aboriginal workers and evicted tens of thousands of pastoral workers. Um, and so later, those were the people that the land rights movement represented because they were homeless. They were living on stock routes and reserves with no water in humpies. And they were called the fringe dwellers and, you know, became the subject of um, rather ugly myths. So these were the people that Fakatsi represented. Now, Fakatsi uh, did, as I say, uh, campaign successfully for two changes to the Constitution to remove the racist part of the Constitution in Section uh, 5126, which uh, prevented the Commonwealth Parliament from making laws for Aborigines and also another section which prevented uh, the Commonwealth from including Aborigines in the census. So after those two parts of the Constitution were, were removed, Aborig most people actually thought that the, this gave Aboriginal people full rights. It didn't. But it did lead to the changes so that Aboriginal people did, in the state and, and territory jurisdictions, eventually right across the country, get the right to franchise or the right to vote and other rights. But it took a long time. But at the same time, it has to be said that what Fakatsi did was lay the groundwork for Indigenous rights, human rights, and uh, the point that we've reached today where we're seriously discussing a constitutional amendment that more fully recognises the previous 65,000 years of Australian history um, and also treaties. So, I just want to say a little bit about myself growing up during that period when people like Walter and Lorna were campaigning for uh, the much improved Australia that we live in today. More work to be done, however. Um, when I was a child in the 1950s in Queensland, I had a strong sense of the difference between my people and the others who lived in town. Uh, for some time, I lived in a native camp on the outskirts of a tiny rural town in Queensland. Eventually, our native camp on the banks of the river was forcibly closed and we were relocated to a desolate place miles from fresh water. I grew up knowing a little about hunting and fishing, about poisonous plants and medicinal plants, but took this for granted. The white locals, as I found out later, knew about the dispersals of my people in the 20th century. When I was uh, about 17, I passed through that town on the way to see my grandmother further west, and an old white man standing on the shop veranda recognised me. He said he knew that I was looking for my people and that they had been shot out by the native police and I would find their bodies in the trees to the north. So that was 50 years ago. I've been told by my grand, that my grandfather met my grandmother near Mitchell, another western town, and they married in the early 20th century on the Aboriginal reserve there. Both had been born in the late 19th century. My grandfather and his twin brother somewhere in the bush in central Queensland, and my grandmother somewhere in the far southwest. Um, so my grandfather and his twin brother were Iman people, and they were taken to the Bundala Reserve for Aboriginals. After World War I, their population was struck by the Spanish flu, the pig swine fever that swept the world as the troops returned from the trenches in Europe. The victims at Bundala were buried in two mass graves and in the 1920s, the remaining population were forced marched to the Warabinda mission. From there, my grandfather and his twin brother, both accomplished horsemen, were indentured to work for graziers. My grandmother, whose family travelled from station to station operating an outfit of well-trained working dogs and, and a dray doing rural labour, eventually became a station cook. She and her sister spoke a language that to me sounds much like Bidjara or Yualarai or one of those closely related languages that the people of the southwest of Queensland spoke. I recalled about 60 words of my grandmother's language in my 20s. 
Technically, like all other Aborigines in Queensland, I was a ward of the state under its legislation that was an iteration of the 1898 Act for the Protection of Aborigines and Prevention of the Sale of Opium Act. Um, there's that conjunction again of Aborigines and those ethnics. I, <coughs> uh, just as a side issue, Joe McGuinness spoke a Chinese language rather well. I don't think it was Mandarin. I think it was more likely to be Cantonese. And that was because um, as when he was growing up in the Northern Territory, Aboriginal people were not allowed to have bank accounts. And so they banked their money with some Chinese shopkeepers who served as the bankers for the Chinese community and the Aboriginal community because both communities were discriminated against and the banking was kept in record books under the counter in the Chinese shops. So when I went to Sydney to go to meetings with him as the General Secretary in 1977, he took me to a Chinese restaurant and we were warmly, effusively welcomed and taken out into the back room where there was much better food, gambling, some extraordinary alcohol. Uh, and uh, he spoke in the Chinese language, in Cantonese, I believe it was, to his hosts for the next two hours. And uh, that was a very big surprise to me. I didn't know that he spoke Chinese, but you know, it goes to the point about the shame that people felt about not speaking English. Um, but I thought it was wonderful because we actually had a fabulous time. Um, <clears throat> and it was interesting to see the old Chinese families still supporting their Aboriginal comrades, and they'd worked together for so many years to build Darwin. Darwin was built by Chinese and Aboriginal people under a very strict apartheid policy. And as I say, there was no such thing as equal wages until 1968, and in reality, still today, there aren't. Um, so I was in my 30s before I fully realised the import of, say, Bruce Pascoe's book, um, that entire Indigenous knowledge systems that had once existed across Australia and um, had, had existed across Australia and that I had grown up in the fading light of one of them. So I understood a little about materials and craftsmanship because I saw the beautiful toolkits and weapons of war and other paraphernalia of everyday life in the museums of Queensland. I'd given little thought, however, to the idea that our people knew about the environments, the flora, the fauna, the weather, and so much else, because I took it for granted. At about the same time, I began to understand that the concept of genocide might fit our experience of large-scale killings on the frontiers, brutal incarceration and supervised racial segregation, and destruction of our cultural, linguistic, and intellectual traditions in very deliberate ways. So I'm very pleased to have given this lecture. I'm very pleased to have been able to honour um, Walter and Lorna Lipman, who did so much to change that terrible world that I grew up in. And uh, reading this book about Walter reminded me that, you know, it's time for our civic leaders to step up, and I know that many do, but we need many more uh, to make it very clear that the Australia that we envisaged raising our children and grandchildren in is slipping away with us from us because of retrograde ideas about humanity. So thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you.